Hello and welcome to Podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. I would like to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon. Your contributions help to make the show sustainable. When you're ready to launch your next project, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so you should check out Linode at www.podcastinit.com slash Linode and get a $20 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for running your app or experimenting with something that you hear about on the show. You can visit the site at www.podcastinit.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the newsletter, read the show notes, and get in touch. To help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes or Google Play Music, tell your friends and coworkers, and share it on social media. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Jeremy Kaufman about Library, a new marketplace for media built on peer-to-peer storage and blockchain technologies. So Jeremy, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, that's right. I'm Jeremy Kaufman, the CEO of Library. And when forced to describe library in one sentence, uh, well, if I'm talking to my grandmother, I say it's like a community controlled YouTube uh, because my grandmother does know what YouTube is. Uh, But if I'm going to explain it to your audience, I would say it is an open source protocol providing decentralized digital content discovery, distribution and access or purchase. Uh, And I'm sure we're going to dive into that in a lot more detail exactly what that means. And how did you first get introduced to Python? So Python is Python is the language that we use uh, to to provide our uh, uh, distributed network for uh, the daemon layer of library. I started using Python myself in probably I was thinking it's my either my junior or senior year of college, which would have been like two thousand six, two thousand seven. I was a computer science and, and physics student at RPI in upstate New York. So you briefly gave a high-level overview of what library is, but I'm wondering if you can give a bit more detailed description of it as well as how the idea for it got started, particularly given the uh, sort of confluence of different technologies that it is using under the covers. Yeah, so it's library can be uh, slightly tricky to get your head around, although I think I'm getting, hopefully I'm getting better at describing it. Fundamentally, what library is, is it's a technology. It's a protocol. We, in fact, picked something that was four letters because library uses a a URL structure like HTTP, LBRY, and library URLs resolve to a piece of digital content uh, or potentially some other things related to that, like a list or things like that, uh, or a a publishing identity. And library is basically what some people have called a fat protocol. It's a protocol that does a little bit more than a thin protocol like HTTP. So that is library as an implementation handles things like that would typically be handled at the layer above, like at the application level, library is handling them at the protocol level. So including things like, you know, payments and managing a digital catalog and so on. But basically we've created a, 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 what we hope is as simple as can be a simple set of APIs to handle digital content discovery and distribution in a completely decentralized, censorship resistant, and basically peer to peer and market driven manner. And I think that there was a second half of that question that I didn't answer, but the answer to the first half was so complex that I'm just going to take a pause there and then see, uh, see where we go. Uh, yeah, sure. So the second part of the question was wondering how you got the idea for it and how you got it started. Yeah, so the idea for it, the the idea that uh, you know, no one really has original ideas, everyone just like combines ideas and tweaks them a little bit and so on, and just it's just layers and layers of this stuff. It's very much that, right? Like, li- so library is an original idea in the sense that this combination of things I don't think has existed before, at least not in this way. But I'd say actually, I think definitely not in this way. But at the same time, it's basically a combination of a couple of different things. One of which was absolutely, I- I've been a fan of, of peer to peer and distributed technologies for a long time, so. Uh, part of the inspiration for library was BitTorrent, uh, which is just a remarkable and really wonderful technology. Another big part of the piece was blockchain technology and Bitcoin, which succinctly, the real innovation there is that we can reach a consensus on a state of affairs in a decentralized manner. Uh, so it's not just about money. What blockchain technology lets us do is, is maintain a decentralized state for any number of things. One thing that that can work really well for is a, a catalog of digital content. Uh, So now we can fix some of the problems that exist with previous decentralized technologies. They have bad incentives. They have poor discovery mechanisms. uh, There are some infringement problems, um, which I think are also related to the previous two. And so now uh, by basically combining these two things, uh, as well as some other um, little twists and innovations, we can create an end-to-end system uh, for, for a decentralized digital marketplace. One particular inspiration was... 
So beyond just knowing about these technologies was there's this great, there's a conversation between Julian Assange uh, and Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google. It's funny that I need to describe who Eric Schmidt is, but uh, not who Julian Assange is, but uh, maybe that's not both were necessary. Anyway, it's like a massive conversation. It's like eight hours long. And Assange, being Assange, published the whole thing online. But in one part of it, Assange is talking about this decentralized DNS system inspired by Bitcoin, like coupling a name to a piece of text. And, and that was also something that got me thinking about this possibility. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of stuff to dive into there. One thing that you did briefly touch on is the idea of bad actors in the network and piracy in distributed content delivery systems. And reading through the FIQ, I know that you have at least a philosophical stance on how that can be addressed in the library protocol. But I'm wondering if you can explain a bit about what mechanisms are present for content owners to address piracy for anybody who does start distributing content that isn't necessarily owned by the person doing the distribution and some of the other network and market effects that are in play to help mitigate that from happening in the first place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is a this question gets a little bit complex because there's library as a protocol, and in that ex- extent, library, you know, like HTTP, to some extent, asking what library does at a protocol level, to some extent, is asking like, uh, what does HTTP do? And the answer is well, it's a protocol, right? There's no there's no centralized registry of of infringing HTTP domains. Well, there are blacklists and things like this, but this is how we handle it. We handle it at this level, uh, and so. For example, in the library browser that we provide, we provide search results. You can use the library browser to search content that's been published to the library network. Those search results are filtered and we respond to DMCA requests and, and filter those. We will also be maintaining a list of, infri- of, of URLs that we know to be infringing. Uh, and so clients that you know, are interested in being on the right side of the law will follow that list or they will be facing uh, very significant penalties. Um, In fact, breaking the law when you're using library, sort of one of of the extra incentives to not use library in a bad way is that the penalties are actually much more severe. When you are caught infringing, like downloading something off of BitTorrent, it's a a civil infraction. Uh, You just, you, you infringed on someone's copyright by accessing it. When you profit off of copyright infringement, it is a criminal infraction. The clients that will be publishing, like the official clients, will respect the blacklist, won't rehost stuff. If you choose to break that rule, you're facing jail time. And it's not like library is designed to obfuscate who you are in that fashion, right? So there's, you know, there's a continuum of how possible it is to pirate things where the most impossible is show you something on a screen in my house. (laughs) Uh, And then like, uh, right, you've got completely in the clear. I think pirating stuff on library is hard. Is gonna be it's gonna be harder for people to do it than it is on BitTorrent. If you're the kind of person who just wants to infringe and doesn't care about paying for stuff, you'll just you'll just keep using the places that are best for you for doing that. So we're trying to capture what the wins from those technologies. Again, BitTorrent's a wonderful technology, but unfortunately, it never really caught on as a as a way of too much mainstream distribution. We, we want to capture that mainstream. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that because it's just such a. <laughs> That, that that's a deep rabbit hole to go down so we'll avoid that one it is a lot of these are deep rabbit holes to go down and if you can't tell already i will uh, spit a lot of words at you so so another aspect of library the protocol is the fact that as you mentioned it's built on a blockchain which if some if, for people who aren't as familiar with the blockchain technology specifically like you mentioned it is the same underlying technology as what bitcoin is using as well as other so-called altcoins such as ethereum and litecoin and a number of others including the namecoin system that you alluded to So I'm wondering if the blockchain that library is using is using is built on top of something like Ethereum using smart contracts, or if you developed your own blockchain purpose built for the specific use of library. Okay, so you gave me a a, there are a couple of things there that uh, inclined me to to get up on a soapbox a little bit. Uh, But I'll start by just giving the straight answer, which is that uh, library has a separate blockchain that blockchain is what's used to maintain the library content catalog. Uh, So the the listing of what's available on library as a protocol. So library as a protocol is larger than the blockchain Uh, library. You know, uh, the blockchain is part of the protocol, but it's not every, it's not like everything that the set of APIs does inherently involves the blockchain. And as a protocol, it's acceptable to pay for things. However, two parties want to handshake uh, in terms of payment. So it's not some kind of thing where uh, you have to use the library blockchain to pay for everything. But one of the interesting things about blockchain is that um, 
in terms of how to think about it, I think a lot of people start thinking about it wrong because they look at Bitcoin and to them like Bitcoin is money. And so they think that or, or some, something like money and therefore Bitcoin as a technology is somehow related to that. And that's wrong. Bitcoin is just a it's just a new kind of database technology. I will frequently say it's the world's crappiest database technology. It, it has it has terrible throughput, uh, long confirmation times, you know, all these downsides in terms of a database, except for one, which is distributed consensus. And so if you've got all of these downsides, it's almost like anti-scaling properties. And so like the notion that everything would ever be on one blockchain, it's like saying we're going to use one database to power all of the world's websites. And also that database is fundamentally bad at scaling. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense, right? So the word kind of altcoin, it's like saying like, are there alt database technologies? You're, you're going to have different databases for different applications. There's, there's nothing about blockchain that says... Let's do everything on top of one blockchain. You mentioned that at the protocol layer, there's no requirement to use the library coin or the library blockchain for settlement of payment for content that's being distributed through the network. And when I was reading through the FAQs, I did see that there was an allowance for third-party settlement. So I'm wondering if you can talk about that a bit and how those third-party settlements would then be recorded as part of the distributed ledger. Actually, the first part of that is the settlement doesn't necessarily have to be recorded as part of the, the ledger. The only hard requirement for usage of library is that the library blockchain acts as essentially a URL scheme and a metadata storage system. It act, it's, the, it's the catalog. And the only reason that you would need library credits is, is for entries in that catalog. That's the only like hard reason. Inside that metadata is you know a pointer to other resources. That pointer could be to any number of things. It could be to HTTP. It could be to BitTorrent. It could be to... FTP, it, it, we have our own uh, sort of DHT-like system that it, it allows for marketized data transactions as well, and that's the default system. But all this stuff, is it's designed to be very open-ended. The only hard requirement is uh, for that catalog. Now, that said, like our client doesn't support th that we've released, like our, our you know, sort of MVP, that it doesn't support paying via Bitcoin. But the API is, you know, you're broadcasting a request, you're offering this. If the other guy says... I have that and I'll accept that, you know, you could say you had five squirrels. And if the guy says, yeah, I'll take five squirrels. I mean, it's up to the rest of you guys figure it out from there, how that's going to happen, you know? So if somebody does settle out of band from the blockchain and doesn't use the library currency for that transaction, I know that one of the other layers of library is the peer-to-peer -peer content distribution network. So for somebody who does settle out of band and doesn't necessarily record that transaction in the ledger or use the uh, provided application or the private provided UI and APIs, I guess in what manner would that distribution then take place? Is that again, just in the hands of the parties who are transacting? Yeah, it's, it's basically that. In terms of the metadata, there's basically... I get how many fields are relevant here. You've got one part of the metadata is the sources, which is basically saying these are the way, this is the way or the ways that you can access this. Then another part is basically saying what the price is, if there is one. And obviously stuff can be free. Uh, we also 100% support and encourage that. And then you know, how you're going to make that payment to that person, which is then going to, if it's assuming the content ha requires a payment, then also how you're going to get the key for it. Yeah, it's it's very open ended, and it's going to be whatever those two parties are willing to kind of you know handshake on. So, in order to be able to support such a large scale and distributed marketplace, the blockchain that you're using under the covers will need to be able to support large transaction volumes, which I know is something that is a problem with the current implementations of Bitcoin, which leads to slow transactions and a inherent limit on the number of transactions that can happen on the blockchain. So what are some of the ways that you've architected your implementation in order to be able to achieve that scalability? I will, again, I'll give the real answer. And then I, I have just a little bit of a soapbox answer to this one that's related to that same one as before. And it's all, these are all kind of interrelated in terms of the mistakes that people make in terms of thinking about blockchain. So the answer is fundamentally, if you want to do a large amount of volume, you have to do stuff at the second layer. Uh, you know, so we're looking at stuff like uh, Lightning Network or whichever one of these seems to be the most promising, uh, but we've been monitoring a lot of them uh, and we've been in contact with the teams that have created them. And we're going to, as we reach those limits, which we're not at, we will uh, be looking at dealing with, you, you know, using something like that. Sorry, this is much more about programming than uh, cryptocurrencies. So, so you know, people probably aren't uh, 
super familiar with like all this Bitcoin drama, but like Bitcoin is just, and all of these that, you know, blockchain, it's, it's fundamentally a, an inefficient technology. You know, blockchain is saying do something in replicate across every single device that's participating as a miner in the network. And, and if you do something on 2 million machines, it's always going to be more expensive than doing it on one machine. And just people forget to trace it all the way back to what's actually happening. And so, you know, like there's like people complaining about Bitcoin transaction fees. And it's like the only reason we have any, you know, the kind of network security that we have now is because for every bit transaction on the Bitcoin network, it's being subsidized to the tune of like, I think it's like $5. Every transaction is costing $5 in real resources. Like that's how much computing power and so on is used. So, so blockchain and microtransactions, that never fundamentally works. You're going to always have to move that stuff to a second layer because microtransactions are the worst thing to do two million times in, in Replicate, you know? And can you dig a bit more into what a Lightning Network is and what that's going to enable in terms of the overall volume? Yeah, absolutely. And so Lightning Network is an example of second layer solutions where second layer solutions is basically there's an ability for nodes to act as things that are like you know, other kinds of institutions in a, in a typical financial system. So, you know, they're basically providing credit and, and settling transactions. And so, you know, they, they may observe a large number of transactions and group them up and bundle them so that rather than pushing a, a thousand transactions to the blockchain, they can do it in, you know, 10. And so that saves space on the blockchain and makes everything more efficient. And uh, Lightning Network is an example of this solution where it involves committing and showing that you have a certain amount of currency, opening up a channel and advertising it, and then people can use that channel and in a trustworthy way know that that payment will ultimately settle. So and that's all I'm going to say about that before I embarrass myself. Going to another layer of the stack is the content distribution mechanism that you've built up, which I know you said that you were at least inspired by BitTorrent. So I'm wondering if you can describe a bit how that uh, how that's implemented and some of the challenges that you faced in the process of getting that rolled out. And also that another aspect of that being how you are encouraging people to take place in that distribution network. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a whole nother piece of library. And this is actually the piece most relevant to Python. All right. All that blockchain stuff. Blockchain is a, you know, C, C plus plus the peer to peer data network is. So this is basically the default publishing method that we use in, in the library application and in the library daemon. Um, it's very similar to BitTorrent in the sense that you're using a DHT pointer to find hosts that have the content. Uh, the difference from BitTorrent is that in this model, the downloader and the host have a chance to negotiate. Um, so basically data is provided in a complete market-like fashion. Let me try to explain that. Basically, you're looking for a chunk of data. When something, when something is published to the library network in this model, it gets encrypted, it gets broken up into a bunch of two megabyte chunks. Each of those two megabyte chunks have a hash. Essentially, the library protocol creates a marketplace where there's a price uh, for each of those hashes. Now we're talking about really, really small prices, fractions and fractions of a penny. In fact, for, for many, many data hashes right now, the price is simply free uh, because the default behavior of our clients is to host things for free. And so more than enough people are running it at free that most people aren't paying data prices. Uh, but it actually creates, and this is, I think, a very powerful idea, uh, the idea of literally a marketplace for data, data as a commodity. And that is that like, if we know a chunk of, of data hashes to a certain value, you know, we can essentially create a marketplace for that data and uh, in a decentralized way, you know, you've got, it, it, it's like, I think it becomes a very efficient way to host things. You have the power of market incentives to, to provision hosting as efficiently as possible. And just as a brief aside for, you, you've mentioned DHT a couple of times, which I'm assuming to mean distributed hash tables for people who just haven't heard that uh, TLA, which again stands for three letter acronym. Oh yeah, I'm 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 bad about that. And please, yeah, interrupt me. I can. That's a it, that's another just wonderful technology, man. You learn how that one works, and you're like, man, that guy was a, that was a smart guy. He thought of that. Uh, you know, the idea of how you can uh, basically, uh, you know, you announce you're looking for a hash, and it can route to a, a, someone that has it without uh, any kind of any kind of centralization, any kind of catalog or anything like that. Yeah, distributed hash tables are pretty mind blowing, and also one of the things that you run into there 
particularly as you grow the amount of data in the network, is the possibility of hash collisions. So I don't know if you have any, if, if you have done any engineering effort on the part of trying to account for and uh, either prevent or uh, resolve hash collisions in the data network. Uh, that's true. That's a good question. I mean, I missed, I actually, and I don't know off the top there, and that's an example of like, oh, I should probably know the size of our you know, hash space off the top of my head, but I don't. I don't know how many bits it is. So I don't know. Uh, I, I'm I'm sure that this is something that they've uh, that we've thought about, um, and it's also something that also you know to by the it's also one of those problems that I call the it's in the good set of problems. Uh, like when, by the time you have that problem, it's like great, we were we were really successful. Well, you know, we can evolve this uh, if it did happen to be something that was absolutely uh, as long as you're not using SHA one or MD five. Then <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, definitely not. So a couple of things uh, going back to the blockchain technology is that for people who have been following what's going on with Bitcoin mining, when it first started off, it was entirely feasible to you know, run a mining client on your laptop or your desktop at home just using CPU capacity. But as the necessary computations have become more complex and the value of the Bitcoins has gone up, people have been making that their entire business purpose. And so there have been application-specific integrated circuits or ASICs developed specifically for the purpose of Bitcoin mining. So it's gotten to the point where your average person doesn't really stand a chance of trying to obtain any currency in that manner unless they're taking part of a mining pool. And so I'm wondering what, if any, uh, engineering effort you've put into the library blockchain to mitigate that eventuality. And if you don't have anything in place from the mining perspective, how do you see the monetization of the data as an alternative to that for people who do want to get involved in the library community and the library blockchain? Yeah. So, well, right off the bat, first I'll say that like the, the hosting is, is the way better way regardless that's true today. And, and actually, I will also go ahead and say, I probably should have said this at some point already, that like, for those people who are interested in library, you can go and check it out right now, uh, especially since, you're, since your audience is programmers, I'll point them to lbry.io slash quickstart uh, as an intro guide that teaches you about the library API and, and gives you a good uh, introduction to, to the technology, although there's just a bunch of good resources on their website in general. But if you're, if you're using it and you want to, to uh, make credits uh, um, way better to contribute your disk space and bandwidth than to compete as a miner. Uh, mining, uh, now we have made choices here to try to uh, combat this. Um, so that, you know, that is we, we chained a number of different uh, hashing algorithms together and we picked ones um, that, you know, we're not matching anything existing. Library is not being ASIC mined right now. I think it would be fairly expensive to do so. I think eventually, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure at, at, at what point that would be possible, but already you're looking at, you know, it's already mining pools and the kinds of people who are buying GPUs and so on that are mining the credits. So it's already something where if you're mining on your own local machine, it's probably not going to be that profitable. I, you know, in, in terms, of, uh, in terms of, of, of just kind of getting something, the, another reason, another easy way to get some stuff is just to come use it right now, because uh, we give a bunch of free credits out uh, in this stage, especially to technical users, uh, because we want to get them testing the technology, vetting the technology, and so on. Yeah, and on that point, I was experimenting with it as I was preparing for the show, and in the process, I published the most recent episode that I released uh, at the time of this recording, and I'm... Uh, probably going to be releasing the rest of the back catalog onto library. So if anybody does want to experiment with it and use that and use the podcast in it uh, show as a means of seeing how the content distribution and content discovery works, then uh, by the time this gets released, those episodes should be up and uh, able to be accessed. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I'll have to check them out on there and make sure uh, everything's uh, going smoothly. What do you think? You want to tell me about the the process here on the show a little bit? You want to give me a little that feel a little live sure. review? Uh, so when I was first getting started, I was just using the API approach for trying to publish, and uh, it's definitely verbose when you're trying to type it all out manually. But from a 
interaction perspective and a UX perspective, it's all pretty seamless. You know, the, the most difficult startup piece was just getting the library credit to be able to uh, publish onto the blockchain because of the, what you were saying of requiring to contribute some of the library currency as a means of reserving the namespace that you want to publish to. Uh, but once I got that out of the way by visiting your Slack channel, it was very easy and painless to publish on the network. To my knowledge, I haven't had anybody download it yet, but I also just did it a couple of hours ago. So I'll let you know once I find out more about the uh, the other end of the transaction. All right. Oh, did you did you set a price for it? So it's uh, is it free or am I? I, I ex- I'm going to go and ch- I am going to go and check it out. So I, I, I experimented it's, it's with setting it at here. ten cents, but I'll also uh, release them okay. for. I'll, I'll also uh, make it available for free for people who don't want to pay. Okay. Okay. All right. Well. Uh, well, I'm, I am glad it worked. You know, we first announced library to the public, sort of to the public, like we were trying to be kind of like quiet about it, uh, which didn't work, by the way. Uh, but when this was like last July uh, and then like and library had like been run on a total of probably like eight computers at that point, like a very small number. And it just didn't work at all. <laughs> uh, and we've been a significant amount of the effort of the last six months has been like getting the technology to the point where like it actually does all the stuff that we had wanted it to do the entire time. Uh, so it's still thrilling to me every time someone says like, oh, yeah, like I watched the video and just like it just worked. I'm like, yes, <laughs> we were not there <laughs> like six weeks ago. That was not always the case. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely a great feeling when people are using stuff that you've been building and uh, dedicating a lot of time and energy and effort into. Indeed, indeed. Um, you know, I think that the you know the potential here is absolutely tremendous, and you know that's part of why our team is putting so much energy into this is because this is going to happen, right? Like it's just the idea that the power of blockchain to to build some of these decentralized applications it's just such a good solution to a lot of uh, a lot of problems and i think we're going to see solutions beyond just digital content in this area um and and certainly it's going to happen in digital content if it's not us it'll be someone else it's going to happen it's like it's guaranteed yeah. in my opinion yeah just as a anecdotal reference to the power of the blockchain and the sort of the mind share that it's gaining i was reading an article a little while ago about a number of banks who were uh working on establishing an international uh, sort of uh, agreement where they were going to try using a blockchain for managing distributed ledgers for transactions between the various banks. So uh, it's definitely an interesting technology that is going to be spreading uh, far beyond where people can even think of right now. A a lot of the bank usages, though, in my opinion, are... are they're exactly the wrong ones. They're exactly the ones that aren't aren't leveraging the real power of blockchain. Like the the power of blockchain is that distributed consensus, and that comes from uh, essentially a massive waste of resources. It comes from doing things two million times instead of doing them once. Uh, if you're if you're this group of banks, you can just make an agreement, and you and you can just run your own network. Like I I don't the the a private blockchain is like. It's not, I don't, it, it's like an oxymoron. It, it doesn't make, it, it's, it, you're throwing, you're getting rid of the whole uh, insight of what blockchain was. So switching gears again, uh, as you mentioned, the at least reference implementation of library is written in Python. So I'm wondering if you can explain a bit about what the decision-making process was that led to that and what some of the uh, benefits and challenges of that choice have been. Yeah, uh, since this is a Python podcast, I wish that the answer was something like, uh, you know, we really studied 20 different languages and did a really detailed analysis and Python was the winner. Uh, but it was uh, basically uh, uh, Jimmy was the person who wrote this layer of library and he liked Python. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, Python's fine with me. And at this point, you know, there's only it's really only a couple of people. And so it started getting written in Python. I mean, I think Python is a good choice. Like, I don't regret Python as a choice in any way, but it wasn't like an especially careful choice. Python is a good choice because, like, there's you know there's an incredible amount of libraries. It's easy to be productive, um, you know, very quickly. A lot of the stuff, similar things, you know, like there's existing DHT implementations already written in Python, you know. So it's it's and, and you know BitTorrent was originally written in Python. So you know there is a it has also kind of established itself as a good uh, you know choice for problems in this domain. Yeah, there are also a lot of really good networking libraries. And as I was running the library daemon on my terminal, I was noticing that you're making use of Twisted for handling that. So, Yeah, right. And so, I mean, I don't know how you feel. I didn't write that much of this part particularly, but I have 
given Twisted a bit of a dive. What, what are your thoughts on Twisted here? Uh, is it just thumbs up, thumbs down, mixed feelings? So Twisted as a library and as an implementation is definitely widely regarded and has a number of years of maturity that it benefits from. Um, it was also one of the first movers in terms of asynchronous networking in Python and even among other languages. So it definitely has a lot of good lessons embedded into it. And also the fact that it includes so many different protocols within the one library makes it very easy to interoperate between those protocols, which lends a lot of power to it. I think that as more asynchronous networking libraries have been added to Python, both the standard library and with things like Tornado, it has been uh, sort of losing ground in terms of popularity just because of the fact that the API is sometimes a little bit difficult to wrap your head around. But as a piece of technology, once you do have it in place, it's definitely pretty bulletproof because of the number of years that it's been run in so many different production contexts. Oh, that's a that's a way better answer than I would have given. So, uh, <laughs> and then and, and you touched on a lot of the things that I would say uh, as well in terms of like it did it provided a lot, and I agree that it's like a very solid technology, and it's it 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 got us here, uh, but it does also seem like it is it's it's sliding a bit, uh, and um, it can also. Uh, and maybe this was uh, per- perhaps us making mistakes in the beginning days as well, but it can just sometimes it just feels like it creates a tangled mess, uh, you know. Yeah, one of the uh, complaints that I have seen leveraged against it is the sort of nested callback architecture, which in my understanding, there are some uh, alternative APIs that it has introduced at least uh, in the past few years to address some of that. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely, yes, they're, they're, it's definitely possible to are. get to the point of having uh, of being in callback hell. Yeah, yes. It's actually gotten better in the span of, uh, man, and again, this may have been us just being behind the curve in terms of how we did some stuff originally. Uh, but it's it's gotten better like in the span of this project existing. So, And one of the things that I did notice when I was installing the Python project is that you're still using Python 2. So I don't know if that's related to the fact that you chose Twisted or if there are any other uh, dependencies that are keeping you on Python 2 at this time. Yeah, I think that's why. I mean, I would definitely like to be on Python 3, but it's just not it's it's not going to be a priority for us to make that switch. I don't think too soon. And how much of the rest of the sort of infrastructure around library is built using Python, whether at the protocol layer or even just at supporting infrastructure? Uh, So it's basically that piece, uh, the daemon level, the part that runs in the background uh, at the operating system level uh, that provides a set of APIs that most uh, clients and users are going to use. That is, however, the biggest and most important uh, piece that we have. Um, the, there, you know, we're a company. And so as a company, you end up having any number of various code bases, but really there's three big ones, um, or, or ones there's in terms of thinking about the ecosystem, there's three, uh, there's the blockchain level, which is CC plus uh, plus a lot more work was done there in the early days than is done now. Um, then you've got the daemon level. So blockchain is like the database. You got the daemon level, which is doing all of the data exchanges, the rules, the handshakes, provides the APIs. It's like, it does a ton. Um, and then you've got the level above that, which is like, you know, applications, clients, um, and our, our sort of proof of concept MVP browser uh, is written in, uh, it's just JavaScript and CSS. It's just a Electron application. As you mentioned, there is a business built around library. So I'm wondering if you can explain a bit what the business model and business plan is for that for the company and some of the things that you've got planned for the future of the company and the protocol. Yeah, absolutely. So there's two factors. One is a, a lot of the things that other open source companies have done, um, which is just generally being experts at your technology, being able to provide value-added services, all kinds of things like that. But really a big part of it is uh, this this nature of what I uh, it's kind of a jargony term fat protocols um, protocols that do more and contain a kind of uh, a built in kind of token that uh, is used to to use the protocols and so we have uh, we have retained ten percent of the credits that will come into existence uh, and so part uh, part of our business is to make the library protocol as successful as we can possibly make it and uh, retain some of the value in the form of the credits that we kept. We have been funded by 
Boston area VCs and some angels from a number of different places. And we have uh, no plans uh, to sell any of our credits for some time. Um, so that's not something we're actively doing, but we have retained them for the future. So if library is a success, you know, three, five, 10 years down the road, that's part of where our return will come from. And as you mentioned, uh, and as is the case, to my understanding, with all of the different blockchains, is there is an upper limit in terms of the number of coins that will ever come into existence because of the nature of how the computations are performed, where they'll ask them to, towards a final value. So once that does happen, um, I guess, how does the currency continue to be in circulation? And what happens at the blockchain level once the number of coins has reached a maximum? Uh, so at that point, it's driven by transaction fees. This is also a point that no blockchain has actually reached in reality. In the case of the library blockchain, you're looking at, you know, it's around 20 years from now. So it's, uh, it's, it's a somewhat theoretical question, but the answer, the, th the current theoretical answer is transaction fees. So from my understanding of this is that the coin or currency level is somewhat independent of the actual ledger. And so even once the maximum number of coins has been mined, then the ledger will still be able to continue on uh, as far as maintaining the tree of transactions. Is that correct? That's exactly right. So there's definitely a lot here, a lot of things that we kind of skated over the surface of because digging into any one of these things could be a full podcast or more on its own. But are there any other topics that you think we should cover before we start to close out the show? Uh, no, I don't. I, I can't think of anything else. Uh, it, it was definitely wonderful to get the chance to, to talk about library. Great. So for anybody who wants to follow you and library and follow what you guys are up to, I'll have you add your preferred contact info to the show notes. And so with that, I'll bring us to the picks. And my pick this week is going to be the book Neuro Tribes which I started reading recently. I'm about a quarter of the way into it so far, and it's very well done. It's a book by uh, one of the Wired authors, and it covers sort of a broad swath of the culture and history and sort of um, you know established research on the subject of autism. So it's a really interesting book, covers a lot of ground. So do you have any picks for us today? Very interesting. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'm going to throw one out since since you went with something uh, to read. I got something to read as well, a little bit related uh, to what we talked about today, but not too much. It's one of the best um, kind of most thought provoking pieces that I've read or had pointed my way in the last, um, I'd say even the last couple of years. Um, it's in the title might not make it sound that way. It's called uh, and just Google this title. You'll find it. Crystals and mud in property law. Uh, it's like a, it's like maybe like a 15 page PDF uh, from like maybe someone at Yale or Yale Press or something like this. Uh, I couldn't even tell you who it's by. I've, I've read it a couple of times. I couldn't even tell you who it's by. I'm, I'm bad. Uh, but it deals with uh, uh, it came up the other day and I was just reading it again. Um, and, it, and it reminded me again just how good it was. Uh, it's dealing with the trade off between uh, hard uh, rules. And so a lot of blockchain systems are about how great hard rules are going to be. Um, um, but also the that uh, your hard rules have problems, and I don't know if you you guys have talked about the DAO, uh, that whole Ethereum scandal thing, um, where that was an example of hard rules got out of control, uh, and so the, the, this fundamental trade off between hard rules and softer, sort of more human systems, and how uh, our law systems and our desire kind of can oscillate between these two extremes, and why that happens, and so on. And it's just very interesting, and it wasn't wasn't something that I had even even thought about or had concepts for before, uh, and so I'll, I'll point it out now. Great. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join me and talk about library and the work that you're doing there. It's definitely a very interesting project, and I'm definitely excited to see where it leads to in the future. So I appreciate that, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, Tobias. You too.